Let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Father Dennis Christ, a missionary of the Precious Blood. Uh, I currently serve the, as Director of Advanced Formation and Director of Precious Blood Parish Missions. I live in our formation house in Chicago and work with those preparing to become missionaries of the Precious Blood, as well as several other uh, members of the congregation. A few days ago, we celebrated the third Sunday of Lent. Then we heard St. Paul address the early Christian community in Corinth. Brothers and sisters, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. I don't know about you, but I've faced stumbling blocks and what seems like foolishness on my journey of faith. Whether traveling through the desert or climbing the mountain, stumbling blocks are not an unusual part of the journey. For many of us, the commandments given to Israel and passed on to us can be stumbling blocks. Most of the time we are able to follow them without difficulty. But once in a while, if we are honest, we have to admit that we have shaped idols in our lives and have placed those idols ahead of the Lord our God. Occasionally, we do bear false witness against others. And every so often, we do envy our neighbors or take advantage of them. Sometimes it seems foolish to do all that the Lord has commanded. When Jesus entered the temple in last Sunday's gospel, he was brokenhearted by what he encountered. The money changers and those selling sheep and oxygen became a stumbling block to his worship of the Father. Sometimes when we hear this gospel, the anger and violent reaction of Jesus to this encounter becomes a stumbling block for us who are used to seeing Jesus only as a peacemaker and never as one capable of such behavior. To be honest, I always find it difficult to preach on this gospel. I never want to describe Jesus as angry. I prefer a picture of a Christ who is always calm and peaceful. His anger may have been righteous, but still his actions seemed violent. A long time ago, when I was a student in college, I faced a huge stumbling brow block. Just before heading back to school for my sophomore year, my father and I were driving to work and he turned to me with great sadness to tell me that his mother, my grandmother, had cancer. She was about to turn 65 years old and doctors had discovered that she had colon cancer. It was a long time ago and at that time, colon cancer was almost always fatal. My grandmother was one of the kindest people I have ever known. She was big around as she was tall. She was five foot two and weighed almost 250 pounds. She loved to cook, to share her cooking with others. She donated bake, to bake sales and other events to help support foreign missions sponsored by her parish. She always had three kinds of pastry in the kitchen table and two more in case company stopped in. She always welcomed the stranger with an open heart and always, always showed love and compassion to her children and grandchildren. When I returned to campus, I signed up for a class on methods of prayer. I thought if I just found the right way, God would hear my prayer. I learned six different ways to pray. I tried them all, but none of them seemed to work. No matter what the method was, I was only looking for a miracle, for a cure for my grandmother's cancer. I wanted to save her life. I wanted God to save her life. When I went home for Christmas, she had lost over half of her body weight. She was so small and weak, 
It was hard to believe this was the same woman I had seen just four months earlier. But her spirits were still high. She was still more concerned with others than about herself. She was filled with hope and still wanted everyone to have a wonderful Christmas and wanted no one to even think about the possibility that this might be her last. Once I returned to campus, I began to give up on God. I wasn't sure where God was in all of this. A few months later, when I returned home for Easter, she weighed only 89 pounds. She had to be carried to the table for Easter dinner. She couldn't cook anything herself, but had a friend bake a birthday cake for my twin brother and me. You see, she had decided long ago that she would celebrate our birthday, she, that she would live long enough to celebrate uh, our, the birthdays, the 21st birthday of her oldest grandsons. And she decided that this year, rather than April 27th, our birthday would be four weeks early so that she could be there. She gave each of her grandchildren something to remember her by. She gave me a statue she received when she was a teenage girl and her family returned to Germany to see where she had been conceived. We all knew, but never said, that this would be the last family gathering with her. A few days later, I was back on campus. I decided that if God could not do anything to save my grandmother, I was no longer going to be a priest or a missionary of the precious blood. On the afternoon of the third Sunday of Easter, I went into the college chapel. I looked around to make sure I was alone, and I began to tell God what I really thought. I took the Bible my grandmother had given me when I graduated from the high school seminary. Yes, once upon a time, there were high school seminaries. And I began to cry out at the top of my voice. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Far from my cry, far from my pleading. You never answer, I cry out. Time and time again, day and night, our ancestors prayed to you and you answered them. Why, why do you not hear me? I continued to yell at God until I got to the end of the psalm where the psalmist promises that he will tell the story and proclaim God's greatness if God would just hear him now. I doubted there would be any miracle that day. I was certain that my grandmother was in her final moments and would be gone soon. And when I finished speaking out loud, pouring my heart out, I was so emotionally, spiritually, and physically drained that I sat down in the sanctuary with my back against the altar and fell asleep. I don't know how long I was asleep, but when I woke up, it felt as if someone was holding me the way my grandmother used to when I was just a little child. I looked up and there just about 15 feet away was a life-sized crucifix. Then I heard deep in my soul, a quiet voice that simply said, Dennis, I know what it's like. Someone I loved died once too. And there on that cross was the image of someone God loved who died once too. And then God and I sat and cried together for those we loved. Finally, I said, if you want her, she's yours. She's been ready for months. She's suffered long enough. If you want her, she's yours. Then I got up, walked back to my dorm, just a few minutes away. 
I sat on the edge of my bed and the phone began to ring down the hall. You have to remember this was days before cell phones had been invented and not every room on campus had their own phone. There was a knock on the door. Someone said, I think it's your mother. She's dead, I said, isn't she? I walked down the hall, took the phone, and my mother described my grandmother's last moments. It seemed that my grandmother had died at the exact moment that I had said, if you want her, she's yours. I had been held in the broken heart of God. And now my grandmother was held in the living heart of God. I don't know if you've ever felt such a stumbling block but I know that in the almost 46 years since then, I've met people who could identify with Psalm 22. They had joined Jesus as he prayed upon the cross. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Many had been afraid to tell God how angry they were, but they understood what it was to have a broken heart. The first time I told this story after I was ordained, I told it in a Christian initiation of adults gathering. When I finished telling the story, a young man who was to be a sponsor that year objected. You can't tell God that. You can't talk to him like that. You can't tell him how you really feel. When I tried to explain to him, he simply stood up, walked out of the room and slammed the door on his way out. He didn't come back to the group for a couple of weeks. And when he did, he asked if he could share his story. My father died when I was seven years old, he said. I couldn't believe that God would make such a thing happen. But I was afraid of God. I was afraid to, God, to tell God what I really thought. I thought that God might just get angry back. So for almost 20 years, I didn't tell God how God had broken my heart. Part of me hated God, but I was just so afraid. Then you told me it was okay to be angry at God, that God could handle it, that I could handle it. I hated you. I hated myself for the foolishness that had kept me from telling God how I really felt. It took me a while, but when I finally told God, God told me he had always known, that he had always been with me, that he was just waiting for the day when he could heal my broken heart. So here I am, finally free of the secret I thought I could keep from God and free from the fear that prevented me from telling God so long. So thank you for telling your story, for it allowed me to tell mine. A few years later, I spent some time with several seminarians from the US visiting the missionaries of the precious blood in Guatemala. It was the 30th year of a civil war that had torn the country apart. While we were there, one of the local missionaries, Father Noe Lemus, took us around to see the places he thought were most important places for us to see. Many of them were churches. And in most of the churches, there were at least three sacred images we absolutely had to see. There was a very realistic crucifix on which hung the bruised, broken, and bloody body of Christ. There was the image of the sorrowful mother with her heart pierced by one or more swords and blood running down the front of her widow's garb. And there was the statue of the dead Christ lying in the tomb. <coughs> After viewing these images over and over again, one of the seminarians complained about their gruesomeness. He hoped we wouldn't have to say any more of him but I told him 
we probably would, and that when we did, he should look not at the statues, but at the people gathered near them. The following evening, we sat down to review what we had seen that day. I asked him what he saw. He said, I saw hope. Hope, I said. I saw hope in the people who saw in these images, a God who knew what it is to suffer. They had hope that just as Jesus would be raised from the dead, so too their nation would one day experience new life. But for now, for now, they knew that God had suffered, that God knew what it was like to suffer, that God suffering made some sense of their suffering. And in that, there was hope. In a few weeks, on Palm Sunday, we'll hear Jesus cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The opening words of Psalm 22. A week later, we will celebrate Easter when we recall that though Jesus felt abandoned, he was in fact not abandoned. For if Jesus had been forsaken by the Father, his body would still be in the grave. If Jesus had actually been abandoned by God, there would be no Easter Sunday, no resurrection, no salvation, nothing to hope for. Because of the resurrection, we have hope. Because of the resurrection, the cross is no longer a stumbling block or foolishness. The crosses in our lives can be stumbling blocks. The sufferings we encounter can seem like foolishness, but in Jesus Christ, God himself has experienced stumbling blocks and foolishness. God himself has had a broken heart. On Good Friday, when we approach the cross, it is there where we will encounter the broken heart of God a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but the, to those who are called Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. As we reflect on the stumbling blocks and the foolishnesses that we encounter along the way in our journey of faith, I ask you to ask yourselves, when has your heart been broken? When have you faced stumbling blocks in your life of faith? What seems like foolishness to you as you journey this life of faith? And when have you been to the cross and experienced its power?